progress. Okay. Happy Sabbath. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for this past week, the blessings that we have had in studying your word, the light that has shone upon our path, and we are in need of you this evening to guide and direct us and correct us. We know, Lord, there is much we have to learn, and we ask that the things we learn can draw us close to you and that our faith can be increased and our trust and dependence upon you strengthened. We pray for those who are suffering in various ways. We know we live in this world of sin, and we ask that you can lift us up above the miasma of this world into your heavenly, heavenly presence, that we can breathe the atmosphere of heaven. Thank you for each person. We ask for a blessing upon them. For those that watch these videos, and we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> well, happy Sabbath and good evening. So uh, tonight we're going to try to cover some of the things that I wanted to cover last week. Now, just as a simple summary, um, we've been studying Colin's prediction, and he doesn't like to call it a prediction, but his, his study on um, the presidents of the United States, and he connects it to Revelation 17, the, the mystery of the, uh, or the wisdom that we have. So this little puzzle, Revelation uh, 17, verse 9, um, and to the Sunday law symbolism from Daniel chapter 3, and our understanding of the presidents of the United States, which we've had uh, since 2015, um, that has been developing since then, but, but was established first in 2015 in a re-understanding of the parallel between the seven kings of Persia and the seven, uh, the last seven presidents of the United States, or the presidents of the United States. Specifically, I guess, initially it would be the four, so there's going to be these four that are going to come, and that's what we had done. So, so Colin had some insight on that, and um, we've been examining it. And some people have thought that I've been opposed to it. Now, I am opposed to the idea that it's Trump or that it has to be Trump because my study of this has shown that, um, that the eighth is uh, not one of the seven, which is how we read it, but is of the seven, which is quite different. But um, we're still going to examine what, what Colin has been saying and, and look at this. But So it's not meant to be a criticism of Colin. It was simply just my observation uh, regarding uh, these prophecies. And as we've looked at them in more detail, we can see um, the reasons uh, that Colin has, and we can see the reasons that I have. And it's not a battle between him and I. Um, it's us trying to study. And I've had another conversation with Colin about it, and he's definitely very amiable regarding these studies. So, you know, we're not at odds with each other, even though sometimes it can appear that way, um, especially when it comes to human emotions, because emotions do exist in all of us. Now, um, so that was the main thing, is that we were, we were looking at this, and I wanted to really make it clear uh, that, that this isn't an attack on someone. Um, we can disagree. We can follow the counsel in the spirit of prophecy. If a brother differs with you, you, know, you don't make him out to be a heretic. You, know, you don't uh, misrepresent or twist his words. And you sit down with him and you study and you go over the points because he may be an error, but you also may be an error. And, and you're not going to know that if you don't understand what your brother's position is. So to me, this is an important part of studying, taking the time uh, to honestly and openly look at things where we do differ and not uh, make the 
person a target of ridicule in any sort of way just because you differ with him. And so that's something I'm not seeking to do. And Colin and I, Colin and I are both in agreement on that point. So um, this mystery here. So one of the things that we've talked about are these seven kings. Now, in this riddle, we know that the pioneers had a different interpretation than this movement had regarding the seven heads. But I've taken the position that their view is actually complementary to what this movement has understood. That is, we would look at the seven heads as Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome Pagan, Rome Papal, the United States being the sixth, and the UN being the seventh, and that the eighth, our understanding of that, and that was where I, I've always had the problem, uh, because we would put it as the papacy. The problem here in this vision is what? What is the problem when we take the papacy and make it one of the heads? Where's the papacy in this vision, Revelation 17? Who's riding the beast? The prostitute. Okay, so the woman is riding the beast, and that woman the, we yeah. would say is a church and she's an impure woman mm -hmm. so she's called the whore right and um so she's a prostitute so she's not a pure church and we would say that that is the catholic church so the heads would represent what if, if the woman represents a church, what do the heads represent? The seven kings that are seven mountains, what do they represent? Kingdoms. So, yeah, so they would be kingdoms or state, right? So you would have church and state. And so... This woman riding the beast is a symbol of the mixture of church and state. And she's committing fornication with this beast, right? That's how we understand this. So if that's the case, can the woman be also one of the heads? No. Okay, so, but we've kind of made it that way. And so we haven't been clear. And I'm not saying that it was wrong, but I'm saying that there's something that we were missing. Now we know that this is similar to the beast in Revelation chapter 13. And so in Revelation chapter 13, you have um, this beast, which is a composite beast. And the pioneers understanding of these heads of this beast were the different forms of Roman government. So it would be state. Um, Iran says the remaining kingdoms after removing three from the 10, she replaces the three. Okay. I don't know if I've seen that application before. Um, Because we don't take the heads as being the ten horns, right? So we have ten horns. So there is another, maybe I'm misunderstanding Iran's point here. But one of the things that the pioneers did in their interpretation of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 is they were consistent with their idea of the horns. And... This was a, a point that Parminder tried to obscure. Um, and I'm not going to go into what Parminder was trying to do, but he really tried to obscure this problem. Um, uh, tried to uh, basically undermine it in what he was doing. So 
Um, but when we try to, what he tried to do, I guess in a simple way, is he would say that the ten horns and the ten toes um, are not the same thing. But the pioneers consistently had them represent the same thing. So we make them as being the UN. Um, but Parminder tried to argue, well, there's only seven now. And, and so you can't have the 10 representing the kingdoms of Europe. But I don't want to go into that part of the study. We're going to come back to that. Now, the main point that I, I'm bringing all this up, just to remind us of this, is that what I promised to do from the beginning was to go back and look at the symbols of seven and eight. So I'm going to go over here to these old, old chart that I made back probably in 2016. Um, and in this chart here, you can see we have, uh, and, and I updated it a little bit, I guess, to make uh, the sixth and the seventh. Um, so this one is, it looks a little funny in that we, we have Dries the Mead, then we have Cyrus, and then we're going to see that three are going to stand up and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. So that's going to be Cambyses, Falsmertus, and Darius the first who are going to stand up. Those are the three. And then the fourth is Xerxes. Now, we marked Xerxes as Trump. We know that there are still seven, uh, the last, or the I guess it's the first seven kings of Persia in this case. Uh, Cyrus being the first king of Persia. Prior to that, it's Meda Persia and Cyrus, uh, who's Darius's nephew. They have an agreement that when Darius passes away, Cyrus gets the entire kingdom. So in a sense, it's no longer a Media per Median Persian kingdom. It's really Persia. And so Cyrus is going to be the first king of Persia, and Artaxerxes is going to be the seventh king of Persia. <coughs> So, so what we were doing back in 2000, I guess it was 2015, is we had started looking at, uh, and we actually even started it back in 2013, looking at the last seven kings of Judah. So Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. So Jeff first started presenting this as uh, the four seven times, Manasseh's captivity, Daniel's captivity under Jehoiakim and uh, um, Jehoiachin's captivity in which Ezekiel is taken captive. And then finally, uh, Zedekiah's captivity. So we had applied these to the four seven times. And that was in 2013. Um, and Jeff first presented it up in Alberta. And I was presenting the four seven times, my at least my initial understanding of these that these were the four events. So Jeff and I were presenting the same thing and regarding these, though I was focused a little bit more upon the chronology, though I was not um, as educated in the chronology as I could have been. I was still quite confused about some of this chronology. I hadn't sorted it all out yet. It took me another year to, to get the basic chronology sorted out. But anyway, we have these last seven kings of Judah and the first seven kings of Persia. And, and we looked at the symbolism of the names of these kings and how they would symbolize things like Jehoiachin would symbolize uh, midnight, things like that. Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, midnight and the midnight cry, I guess, because they're doubling. It's basically the same name. They mean the same thing. Um, and then we had uh, looked at the last seven kings of northern Israel, I believe even the first seven kings of Judah and the first seven kings of northern Israel. Some of that, those studies I missed uh, because I was busy on other things, but I, you know, I know that we study them. Now, and we're going to look at this a little bit more, but there are some questions that had come in regard to this. Now, the other thing that we looked at also was um, the Roman emperors, right? So that was something Adilio had done, but it was also he had done that based upon a study 
that had been done by blessings uh, back before we had any of this time setting, so to speak, um, ideas. So before we had November 9th, there was these studies regarding uh, the Roman emperors. Now, Jeff had also done some work dealing with the emperors, and his work differed from that being done by blessings. So, so there were some differences that were going on in how people were trying to sort out the numbering of these things and, and what we saw that they symbolized. And so we've looked at some of that. The other thing, of course, we looked at was um, uh, Ralph Meyer's um, The Names of the Popes, which is different than counting the popes themselves, you know, from the Lateran Treaty, which often people do. So his was quite a bit different study. So, so we've looked at those things, but some new things have come up that we're going to look at first and then come back to these. Now, uh, the first thing that came up, it was in a study that Stephen was doing in the morning. So I wasn't there. Um, I listened to it afterwards. And um, so I guess where we could go first, and anybody who has watched those, they could help me a little bit. Um, so this is John chapter 4. Now, this is the woman at the well. So we're all very familiar with this. So we know she's a Samaritan. So what kingdom is she of? Can we say that she represents northern Israel, even though she's a Samaritan? You guys are going to need to talk. <laughs> yes, you're going to talk. Here. Yes, she represents the Northern Kingdom. Okay, so what would be the reason that she represents the Northern Kingdom? Because we know the Northern Kingdom has been scattered, never to be gathered, at least literal Israel. So why would this Samaritan woman who's been placed in to replace Northern Israel, why would she represent Northern Israel? What would be some reasons that we could argue she represents northern Israel? There may be a remnant people. Okay, so, so we know that northern Israel scattered never to be gathered, but we know that there is this period called the times of the Gentiles. So would a Samaritan woman be a Gentile? Yes. Yeah. So she's a Gentile. She's not Israel. Mm -hmm. But we know at the end of the 2520, for northern Israel, there's going to be a gathering that happens in 1798. That's going to be at the end of the 2520. So literal Israel is not gathered, but spiritual Israel is gathered. And spiritual Israel is made up of what? Commandment keepers? Well, okay, that would be spiritual Judah. So, so we know that in 1798, we don't have Protestants being commandment keepers. That is, they don't have the Sabbath and they don't have the sanctuary. So they're being typified by northern Israel, the area of northern Israel, in which the Gentiles have now occupied, the Samaritans have occupied. And so they're going to be gathered and they're going to be tested, the Protestants. So Protestant America rises in 1798 at the end of the 2520, the end of the 1260 of, of years of persecution of the papacy. And it's going to now replace Northern Israel as God's people. It's going to become the false prophet. So the characteristics and the aspects that we see of northern Israel, it's a two-horned power, right? That is, you have uh, Dan and Bethel, two golden calves. Dan, Dan being a judge, and Bethel being the house of God. So that's church and state. And we see that in 1798, we have a two-horned beast that has these the horns that are church and state. 
right? That is Republicanism, which is state, and Protestantism, which is the church. So, so we can see that those symbols there uh, apply to northern Israel. Now, they also apply to Persia, right? So Persia also typifies the United States because it's also a two-horned power. And so the two-horned beast, which sometimes people depict as like a buffalo or something, a horn's like a lamb, but it speaks as a dragon. Uh, this two-horned beast in Revelation chapter 13 is in some ways analogous to the ram in Daniel chapter 8. That is, the ram is a type, and it represents, so we see that the United States has that same characteristic in some ways, and that's that two horn power. So, so we can look at this woman, the Samaritan woman, and also the other fact that she's a woman. What would that mean? If she's a woman, what is she representing? Church. A church. Okay. And now there's lots to this story, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but we're going to focus on one aspect of the story. And this aspect has to do with her husbands. Now, how many husbands did she have? Five. Five. Okay, what would be the significance of five husbands here? Five are fallen. Okay, five are five have fallen, right? So so we can see that there's something here about these husbands. And husbands represent what? So the woman represents the church. What church? What what does the husbands represent? The state. Yeah, so they would represent the state. And so we can see here we have, she had five husbands. Five are fallen. Now the one that is, is not her husband, right? Correct. Yeah, so we couldn't say five or fallen one is. We could say five or fallen and one is is not. Now it doesn't say anything about what's going to happen after that. It, you know, in, in sort of any literal sense, how many husbands she's going to have. But we can see here is there's this symbol of the five that are fallen. Now. We have another story. So these were things that were brought up by Stephen just in, in passing. So he didn't look into these in detail. Um, and this one is in Luke chapter 20. And this is the Sadducees questioning Christ regarding the resurrection. So they think of this question uh, because the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. So they believe that all there was was the present life, which would really take uh, quite a turn as far as what you believe and what you would do in your actions. If you only believed that this life existed, I'm not really sure how you could relate to what God gives promises in his word. But for the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection either body or spirit, right? So they had no idea of there being a resurrection. And so they bring up this question. Um, if any man's brother die having a wife and he die without children, it, Moses taught us that the brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. I actually have that happening in um, uh, my background and my ancestry. So, um, my mom's mom, so my grandmother, her first husband died, and she had already had a, a daughter. And so my grandfather, who um, his, his, um, his brother was married to my grandmother's sister. So when my grandmother's husband died, he then took the place of him. He married my grandmother. 
So, so that's the type of thing that we have. So that is the brother, um, his brother, well, in this case, it wasn't his brother. So it was the brother of, so it was still a relative, but he, he took up this wife. So to raise up seed unto his brother. So this is this idea that somebody has to take this responsibility. Now it says, there were therefore seven brothers and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her to wife and he died childless and the third took her and in like manner, the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose life of them is she? For seven had her to wife. Now, what is this question asking in a spiritual sense? So not what, what are they asking him, but what would we look at this as a symbol? So who are the seven brethren in this case? If we're going to take this question and apply it as a parable, even though Jesus isn't making this parable, this story, um, we can see some aspects here. So what are the first aspects that we could take from this story and connect it to Revelation 17? Seven brothers or seven heads. Okay, so you have seven brothers, and, and men are going to represent the state, right? It's like Adam represents state, Eve represents the church. When we studied in um, Genesis chapter 3. So now we have um, these seven brothers, and the woman represents a church. Now, this church is childless. So what does that tell us about this church? It's fruitless. Yeah, it's fruitless, right? So, um, so however we look at this church, this wouldn't necessarily be a good church, right? It's, it's, it's a fruitless church. And this woman is going to die also, right? Now it talks, though, about this resurrection. So what is the place of the resurrection? And that must be Dwight who signed in using my, uh, my name. I, I wasn't don't. trying to. <laughs> I am well, I look, I look different. <laughs> yes, you do look different. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So, so uh, what we're doing right now, Dwight, is we're we're looking at uh, we looked at the five, um, the five husbands of the woman at the well. Right. And now we're looking at uh, the seven men, seven brothers who take uh, this woman to wife, and they all die childless, and she dies. Right. And, and and Stephen had alluded to this, as you remember, on the right. video, though we didn't go to it in depth. He just said that there's some kind of connection, he believed. Right. To to Revelation 17. Right. OK, so so if you have any insight on this, it would be helpful. So I, I've thought about it because I only watched it this morning um, while I was doing guitar repair. So okay. uh, and then I looked at it a bit more in the afternoon, read over the verses prayed about it. Um, and, and there definitely is something here. Now, the question I was asking was about the resurrection. So, so they're asking about the resurrection. Right. And what would be this, the purpose here of the resurrection as a symbol, if we're connecting it to Revelation 17? Well, as a wild guess, um, because this is, this is something when Stephen brought it up, I mean, it's, it's in the back of my mind mm -hmm. and I've got, there, there's some other things that, that I've had in the foreground, but on this with the resurrection, would we be tying this more with either the Sunday law or 
with the resurrection of the just. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I think we would be tying it more with the Sunday law. Right. Looking at Revelation 17. Now, here we had noted that um, the woman is childless. So this wife doesn't have children. So right. she's fruitless. Right. And and she's also going to die. But we're told that she's going to be resurrected, at, at least there. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, but they're saying, well, um, whose wife of them is she? For the seven had her to wife. But then, OK, since we're dealing with a woman. Yeah. That had been had by seven men. Yeah. Would she be more representative of the church? Right. And in this case, the woman who's riding the beast. Right. Because we would have to say that this woman in Revelation 17, she's having. Now, here it's not in considered an impure marriage or anything, but she's having relations with the seven headed beast. OK, so we can say that that this woman is, in a sense, representing that. Now, again, it's not a parable of Jesus. He didn't. But it is in the Bible as an right. illustration. And and we have some of the same symbols here. The men, the brothers representing the state, the woman representing the church. And uh, there's seven of the brothers. And also we have the symbol of the resurrection. Right. Now, in, in this case here, um, if we're taking it the, the resurrection of the church, right, because they're saying, well, um, they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage is what Christ says. So right. in this case, this illustration that they're using, there is no marriage in heaven, but we know that the church is the bride. So right. these are, in a sense, a type of contrast, if we're going to look at them, or a counterfeit. So in this context, if we take this story, this illustration that the Sadducees are using to try to trip up Christ, they're misunderstanding the purpose of marriage, of what it symbolizes. They're focused upon the literal. Right. And, and Christ is saying that there's something greater here because it's not about just having our lives in heaven that we had on earth, that we are now married to Christ. Mm -hmm. The church is this bride. And, and so he's really giving this stark contrast to the way that they're looking at it in their sort of nitpicky literal way, trying to trip him up, but they don't understand spiritual things. And, and I think that's the main point of his argument. But we can see that this does relate to this idea of the symbolism in Revelation 17. Right. Now, with the woman at the well, we saw that she had five husbands. So, again, we took that five. Five are fallen. But these are not complete pictures. They're, they're alluding to it. They're adding some information, but we can't go through these and say, here is the complete story. This is Revelation 17. Right. But they are symbolizing this. Okay, so um, you have thought there, Dwight, or anyone? Well, I mean, the, the situation in this, and this was going through some of the things that, that Stephen had been alluding to. Here are the five husbands. Yeah. So five that were. One that is not. One, but one that is, is not well, a husband. Well, but... well, yeah, but not a husband. But she says, he says, the one you have now is not your husband. So it's kind of interesting in that sense. It's an is not rather than an is. Right. Because yeah. she had five with whom she entered into a covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. Yet the man that she was with, she had not entered into a covenant relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I mean, to me, this is still an incomplete study in as, as far as, as um, how this relates. Like, there, I'm going to have to look into this more, but I just felt it was important to look at this first before we go into some of the other things. Right. Um, and, and what I really want to show here is that, and we looked at a little bit before you got here, just that when you're looking at the beast in Revelation 17, 
that you have this woman who is um, uh, riding this beast. She's having right. fornication with this beast. And it has seven heads. But we have simply always looked at the Catholic Church or the papacy as one of the heads. But it's also the one riding the beast, which I've always had problems with, which is why right. the pioneers understanding in their, what I would call the primary application of that is that these are the different forms of Roman government. They refer to the state where the woman herself is re referencing this church. But there still is a state aspect that exists with the papacy. But that state aspect is not the papacy itself. It's its um, relationship with initially France uh, during that 1260 years. I mean, I mean, mostly just France is what it's about, though it encompasses all of Europe. But France is the one that puts it on the throne and France is the one that removes it from the throne. So, um, so we can see that there's there's a problem which I've always had, maybe other people haven't had, but in our interpretation of the seven heads, just saying one of the heads is the papacy. Um, if you say it's a papal form of Roman government, well, that would be different because that would be um, dealing with the state itself. Now, uh, another point um, uh, that, that we're going to look at as we, we go over to this chart. So... So this was the chart that I'd made a long time ago and updated a little bit. I think one time I had the numbers mixed up and that really confuses people. So I know I fixed that. But we see that there's this four. So this is Daniel chapter 11, verse one to three. We can see that there's three shall stand up in Persia. The fourth shall be far richer than they all. And he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So you have Xerxes stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. And that's going to be uh, Esther chapter one. Now we know also it doesn't tell us about that specifically him losing other than that. It gives the history after he loses, when he comes back, he's then going to uh, find a new wife. So he doesn't find a new wife to replace Vashti uh, in chapter one. And it doesn't, and he's going to have that war between Greece in the interim and then he's going to uh, take Esther to wife. And in that story, there is also a Sunday law. Now, one of the problems that we had when we went through the story of Esther is we know that the first angel's message is typified by Cyrus's decree. The second angel's message typified by Darius's decree. And the third angel's message typified by Artaxerxes' decree. But Xerxes' story of the Sunday law is a typical Sunday law that exists under the second angel's message. And I've argued that Trump is typified by Xerxes and that the Sunday law that Trump had related to the pandemic. That the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law. And when Jeff initially uh, pointed to a pandemic, he put them between the two way marks, midnight and the midnight cry, between raffia and pineum. And he did that on January 14th, 2017. So that symbol of Trump between raffia and pineum can't refer to Biden because Trump is Xerxes. He's the one who typifies that Sunday law. And Yet we also make an application of raffia in January 6, 2021. So the siege of Washington, we also say is raffia. Now that can confuse people because we, if we haven't spent the time understanding the lines that we've done, we've noticed now that when we zoom into lines, into a waymark, that that waymark will have all the characteristics of a reform line. And the problem that we had with November 9th and July 18th is not that they were incorrect, 
but we didn't realize their typical nature. And their typical nature was primarily internal within this movement, but it was witnessed to by external events, not the events that we predicted per se, at least not all of them, but by what was happening with our prediction. And the witness primarily was the chronology of those events. Now we had things like the 100 days of prayer, we had the bombing of Nashville. Uh, we had um, the siege of Washington, which started the 10 days of prayer. And all of those things, in a sense, uh, marked that those way marks dealing with the pandemic. And, and specifically, if we think about the pandemic and we look at Odilio's study on that, he shows quite clearly that the pandemic happens at the right time that it's connected with the 777 days. So he uses the mandates, and we can see also that, that those mandates come um, specifically under Biden, but, but, but under, you know, the, the, it's kind of a crossover between the two, um, that whole si situation. So Biden has a part to play in it, but it's primarily Trump and he's going to lose to Greece, right? So if Trump is um, Xerxes and he's stirring up all against the realm of Grecia and he's going to lose that, we can see that Trump loses that. So even in a sense, um, what happens on January 6th is Trump losing to Greece, but he's also Xerxes being deceived by uh, by Haman, right? So there's this deception that happens with Trump as well. So it's not as linear as we would like, but it has all of the symbols or the types of that. And so we can say that what happened with the pandemic is it's a type of the Sunday law, but it's not the Sunday law itself, because we know that the story of, of Xerxes and Esther and um, Haman that those are types of the Sunday law, but it's in the wrong place within the first, second, and third decrees to really be truly the Sunday law. That is, the Sunday law is going to be connected to the third angel's message or the third decree. And so this was something that we struggled with, and, and we still struggle with it. We don't have complete answers regarding it, but we have a little bit more of a hint that just because we see a reform line when we look at a way mark doesn't mean that we would then um, say that that's the whole reform line. And so sorting through these different reform lines um, has been something that we've been doing in the morning studies. Now, when we look at uh, the presidents of the United States, we can count them differently. Now, here, we're putting Reagan as zero and Bush as one. And, and why are we doing this? What, what's the reason that we do this here at the beginning? Because in 1989, the period that we're, <clears throat> we've been looking at, Reagan was yet president at the very first, and then Bush took over for him after the election of 88. Right. And, and we know that um, this, here, this history here with the Medes, this is the fall of Babylon. Cyrus is the general, right? But Darius is the Mede is the one that the Bible tells us that became the king of Babylon, and he did. So Cyrus isn't the king of Babylon. He's king of lands in 539 but he doesn't become the king of babylon until darius passes away right so then he he's the king of persia and he's been the king of persia for i can't remember how many years 19 years or something 13 years i can't remember i always forget the number but he's been the pink king of persia for a long time and he's also running the army of the medes and the persians and and so he's the general who's involved in taking down Babylon in 539. But 
he becomes the king of Babylon in 537. So we mark him as the first king of Persia. And so in our history, when we look at 1989, going to that, that first 777 days from November 9th to December 25th, um, we mark Bush 1 as aligning with Cyrus. And then Clinton aligns with Cambyses and Bush the second with false Smyrtis and Obama with Darius and Trump with Xerxes. Now, then we would say, well, Trump is the last president of the United States. Now, from our perspective back in 2016, um, we still had these numbers to make up, but we weren't really thinking about that. We weren't saying, well, there's going to be another president of the United States and then a seventh president of the United States. So now if we were to um, do this, so I'm going to put Biden here. And then I'm just going to copy Trump and repeat him. This is the suggestion of in, in a very rough sense of what Colin is saying. Now, what would be the virtue of this? What would be, how would he be apply, applying the riddle here? So he would say five are fallen. That's going to be these five. One is, that would be Biden, and one is yet to come. Now, Remember, he's also paralleling this with the image of Daniel chapter 3, which is a um, based upon the template of the image of Daniel chapter 2. That is, it's going to be an image, and it's going to look the same, except it's going to be all of gold. So that is Babylon wants to continue all the way through. And we can see that when we get to the foot of that image, it's still going to be Babylon. And that's really, in a sense, true of the image that's Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, etc. Correct? Mm -hmm. Can we see that the image of chapter two, even though it, Babylon is the head of gold, that all of the kingdoms that follow are still descended from Babylon? Okay, but there's there's one problem that I've been having with this. Okay. As you're going through this, mm -hmm. as you have, as you've laid out here in the numbering. Yeah. That places Trump as the fifth and the seventh. Yeah. We've never addressed the eighth. Right. So what people have to do then is they have to go back and say Reagan is the first, Bush is the second, Clinton is the third, right? So you have to do it that way. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I get that. Yeah, so, so that's not really, at least in any of the presentations that I've watched, I haven't seen that specifically addressed by, um, by Colin. Whoops. So he would have to have the numbers be like this. Correct? No, I, I understand that part of it. Yeah, I know. We're just looking at it. We're, I know. We're, yeah, I, but you can see the problem here. That, And, and this is the similar problem that... Um, we see with Odilio's study on Nero, right? Because we have we have these emperors, but we have to number them differently than we would have numbered them. So if we did this, we would see, I, I, mean, I mean, at least I think that this is what um, Colin is doing. Uh, I should bring up the image again. Um, somewhere way back here.
Oh, I know where it is. Just hang on. So, okay, just uh, what are some problems you see with that while I'm trying to find this image here, Dwight? Well, the problem, the, the biggest issue that I'm seeing right now is that there were some applications, especially pointing to a strong leader. Now, Mr. Biden, for all of his aspects, strength of, uh, as a leader is not one of them. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Now, the situation that we're dealing with here where you had the combination of Reagan and Bush at the very first, you're still speaking of one administration segueing from one to another, very much like what you were pointing out with Cyrus and Darius. Yeah. Now, they were united in the principle that they had in the overthrow of Babylon. So for all intents and purposes, this was a kingdom that was coming against another kingdom. Yeah. So that's, that's part of what I'm looking at there. Okay, so here, I'm just going to bring up just to show you what he's done. So you can see here, he's going to count Ronald Reagan as the first and George Bush, Bush Sr. as the second, which is not how we counted them in the past. All right, so that's the main point I wanted to make there. Yeah, now you're saying it's it's the same administration going from Reagan to George Bush Sr.? Right. And they're both Republicans, they just... Reagan had already had his two um, terms. Correct. And so George Bush Sr. just takes over. Uh, right. Yeah. So the, the application there of having this similar to the Medes and Persians is, to me, would be correct. Yeah. I would have a hard time if I was saying that Ronald Reagan was Babylon and George Bush Sr. was the Medes and Persians. I see the two of them being more as Medes and Persians, period. Yeah, so what we would say, as far as the list where we look at the, the first, when we're looking at this first seven kings of Persia, we're going to have George Bush Sr. being typified by Cyrus. So he would be the first king. So one thing we can see here is it doesn't line up with the numbering that we had before. And it, and it doesn't line up with, with the numbering also of the three shall stand up in the fourth as well. But, but that's another issue. And, exactly. And we also had these, so we had the seven kings of Persia, but we were only lining up up to Trump, ignoring the last two placeholders. Now, uh, we could then have seen that those are going to be something that's not um, Trump in the sense of um, we could say the globalists and the papacy. So you'd have Donald Trump being the, um, the symbol of Protestant, um, the Protestants, right? So the false prophet. So Trump sort of takes that place and then you would have the globalists come in and that would be the seventh head and then under that seventh head you're going to have this union of protestant america with these with the globalists and with the papacy and the papacy would be the eighth head so when we look at how we had done it before uh, I, I think that's how we would have understood it if we're going to parallel it. And, and specifically, the way that um, Jeff did it 
which which I didn't agree with. But the way that he did it is he said, well, Trump is going to be the head of the UN. So the United States will then control the UN through Donald Trump. And that would still be the sixth. Um, well, I guess that would have technically been the seventh. So, so I'm not quite sure how how we would understand this. So this to me is one is it's not consistent with what we taught before, as far as the numbering. But also, um, you would have Donald Trump being the fifth. I guess him being the UN would have been the sixth. The seventh would have been. the papacy or something. I, so I, I'm not quite sure how we would have done it because I don't think we got that far. So you can see some of the problems that that arise when we try to look at what we taught in the past and we try to apply this in this numbering. And, and there was a lot more to it. Also the names of what these presidents symbolized and and how we would then fit that in with end time events with the way marks that we had so one thing we would not have done is we wouldn't have put Rafi and Paneum as the seventh and the eighth right and remember we're going to have uh, this numbering George Bush would be one so Donald Trump would be five not six and then you would have the sixth and the seventh and then you would finally have the eighth which would be the papacy. So it, it doesn't really fit from, from that perspective. But I st still think there is something there. So I, I think there's something wrong with how he's numbering this in the first place. So I don't think I would have taken this numbering based upon what we taught in the past. Does, does that make sense to people? That if we look at what we taught in the past, that this numbering on the bottom doesn't make sense. And especially since what we did is we applied the eighth to the papacy. So now we're going to apply the eighth to the papacy. So we still have to hold on to how we understood it before, but have another application that's going to be applying to the presidents of the United States. So he's basically just taking the riddle and applying it to Daniel chapter three and Daniel chapter 11 verses 1 to 3 that he's not really taking a new interpretation of revelation 17 that is he's not going to argue that this is actually what the heads are in that beast at least that's my understanding of what he's saying a anybody with thoughts on that oh i have a question okay not being uh, having the background that you all have in the movement. Yeah. The question is what brought about the uh, reason or the onus for comparing the presidents to these first um, kings within Daniel 11, 1 through what, 3, 2, 3? Okay. So, about... so good question. Now, um, so what we had done is we had compared some histories. Uh, maybe I could even find it here. Um, so the histories we had is we had um, the three decrees are parallel to the three angels' messages. The three decrees commence the 2300 days, and the three angels' messages uh, end the 2300 days. And these are our major reform lines. And we could clearly see the parallel between that, especially in regard to the time of the end. That is, it's the time of the end for literal Babylon in 539, and it's going to be the time of the end for spiritual Babylon in 1798. Right? So you can see that. That makes sense? Yes, I do. Okay. And then what we did is we, um, we, and kind of ignore this diagram, it's not the one I want. I have too many diagrams. I need to create different, different PowerPoint files with different diagrams on them. But anyway, um, I think it might be up here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, no, that's not it. It's earlier. 
And I'm just going to quickly go back. These are the ones we were dealing with that I... I have a lot of diagrams. Yeah, this goes oh, way man. back. <laughs> you got a lot of wheels within wheels. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, this would be a lot further back. Yeah, this is earlier studies. Um, let me see if I go here. That's that diagram. There's got to be a better one. Here it is. Ah, there we go. So what we have here is we have these three lines. So you can see this line here, um, and I've kind of mixed them together. But just look at the top part. You've got Darius, the Mede, Cyrus. This is going to be the decrees. Cyrus's decree, Darius's decree, Artaxerxes' decree. And we can put this as a line dealing with the time of the end, the formalization of the message, the empowerment of the message, uh, the arrival of the second angel's message, the formalization and empowerment of that message, etc. Right. So we could we could line these up just as you see above. Now in 1798, this is just the the way marks we have for the reform line, and then here in 1989, we could see that this is a repeat of this history. And so that's also a repeat of this history. So 1989 is going to have us have the same thing. It's going to be a time of the end. And at that time of the end, we're going to have these um, this, this event. Now, this is going to be the, dealing with the, the beginning of the fall of modern Babylon in 1989. Now, originally, Jeff put 1989, the fall of the Soviet Union. But... Um, and, and he had that as the empowerment of the first, he had that as paralleling August 11th, 1840. So I don't want to bring in too many elements, but just the simple idea that we can take these three reform lines and we can see that they are parallel means that we have a time at the end. And primarily what we're doing, even though we connect this with 1798, when it comes to the presidents, we're taking this here. Reagan, Bush one, Clinton, Bush two, Obama and Trump, and paralleling them with these kings here, going up to Xerxes. So we can see that Trump is going to exist under this period of time of what we would call the second decree, prior to the third decree. Now, so when we had this diagram, we didn't and this was drawn a while ago, so I can't remember that this is quite an old diagram. Uh, but we still, I put the sixth and the seventh there because we're marking Artabanus and Artaxerxes. But we didn't put any presidents there because Trump is the last president of the United States. But remember, Xerxes loses to Greece. Now, it's what's written in the scripture of truth, right? So we know or noted in the scripture of truth. And so when Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, addresses these fourth, it's going to jump to Greece, specifically to Alexander the Great, and ignore all of this history that we have here, even though Artaxerxes is mentioned in Scripture. Um, it's, it's really when Xerxes loses to Greece, we now have this, this change in the kings of Persia. Now, they're not defeated by Greece in the sense they're conquered. They go to Greece and they lose this battle. But then the prophecy is going to move to Greece. So when we're dealing with Trump, what would we expect to follow Trump if he's the last president of the United States? Wouldn't we expect him to be defeated by Greece, by the globalists, and that the globalists will then come into history? Yeah, see, here's the one where I got these numbers backwards. 
So that was it. I don't know why I put them backwards. But anyway, they're corrected. So in that bottom reform line, where where is the uh, third angel? Well, where do you put that in the reform line? Is that that's where you see it as Xerxes? Because that's the decree. So Cyrus has a decree that ends the 140 years and the 70 years. 140 beginning with uh, um, um, King Manasseh, his captivity. And, and then the 70 years beginning with Daniel's captivity. They're both ended with Cyrus's coming to the throne and following his, his decree ends those periods. Darius is going to end the 70 years for the temple. And Artaxerxes is going to end another period of 140 years and a period of 220 years. So the 140 years from Jehoiachin's captivity, which is the third seven times, and also the 220 years that mark that entire period from Manasseh's captivity to Artaxerxes' decree. So there's 220 years. So there's all these other periods that are, are ending with these decrees. So this is going to be the third decree, and it's going to commence the 2300 days, just as the third angel's message ends the 2300 days. So this reform line is going to be the commencement of the 2300 days. And so it has to be the first, second, and third angel's messages, the first, second, and third decree. And Ellen White says we need all three decrees. So... Cyrus's decree commencing, uh, Darius's affirming, and Artaxerxes uh, finishing. I can't remember the word she Manson? uses. No, nope, finishing. Finishing uh, the, the specifications for the prophecy to commence the 70 weeks in the 2300 days, specifically the 70 weeks. But so, so we have this reform line here. And we can see then we can take, and this is what was happening in 2015, is they were looking at these kings of Persia and they realized we had a time of the end and we could map the end up. And, and, and then we could say, well, there's three that are going to rise up, right? Cambyses, False Murders, and Darius, and Xerxes is the fourth. So that's going to be... Trump being the fourth. Now, he's the fifth here and just in this count, right? But the fourth in the other count, right? So when we go here, you can see there is the, the numbering of the three and then the fourth. So it's a three-one combination. But but now what I've done here is I've put Biden and and Trump again repeated. We should be able to see the problems with this. So first, it's it's the wrong numbering because they're going to have to go back here to get Trump to be the eighth. And you know, if you were going to do this and just have Trump come back in, I would argue that you would need to do this. And why would I say that? Why would I want to put if, if you were going to do it, why would I say that this is what you must do? That the eighth has to be somebody else than Trump based upon what? Why would I say that? And I'm not saying that we would do this, but I'm just saying if I was going to be consistent, I think I would. I couldn't make Trump the eighth. Yeah, it just to me, it just does not. It doesn't track with what we've been studying. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't track with all kinds of things we've been studying, but also it doesn't track with what we taught in the past. So. I'm not I'm saying that there is that we should be looking for the something to fill these places. But we wouldn't be looking at Trump to fill this place. 
what I would say is that we're looking at Trump as being Xerxes and he loses to Greece. The thing that's going to be filling this place is the globalists. So we, we would have to figure out what, what, how we would apply this riddle to this because Trump can't be the sixth, right? If we take this line back where it was, you can't have Trump as the sixth because then you would have to make Reagan the first. Exactly. Right. So, so it doesn't line up with what we taught about the seven kings of Persia. That's, that's you know, part of, of, of the problem here. Now, there are other things, but, but this would be one of them. Now, um, I had some things here. So this is what you see here is the last seven kings of Judah. So we're going to finish at 8.30 tonight. So it's 8.17. So we're not going to get through much here today. But what, what I wanted to look at is really what is the issues that are arising with what we taught before and what we are trying to do now. Now, when we deal with Manasseh to Zedekiah, we would have to say that there is a connection here between um, the riddle, would we not? Agreed. Okay. Now, kind of ignore the numbering I have under there. I have the numbering going both way. I was just, I was just sort of experimenting and thinking about if the line could go the opposite direction. Uh, that is, you would count. Uh, the last one first, but you know we're still going to count them from left to right um, in order that they occurred, not backwards. But we know that, um, and we talked about this before, that Zedekiah is the seventh, but who's the eighth? So who follows Zedekiah as the king of Judah? I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is. So who is the eighth? So Christ is the eighth. And we can see that this has to be the case, that this is an example of a true line, not the counterfeit that Revelation 17 is. Now, we know that Christ is not one of these seven kings. That is, we don't have one of these kings resurrected to become the Messiah. We have Christ himself. And, and we know that the prophecy to the riddle does not say he's one of the seven, that he's of the seven. So is Christ of the seven? Yes, he's descended of the seven. Yeah, he's descended. Now, also, even if we apply it, five or fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, now, we, we have this, this part of this riddle that we're going to have to look at, and, and we can't look at it now. But we know that, that the eighth is of the seven. And, but we can apply this here. We know that there's not a beast here, that we're not looking at, at worldly powers. But if we look at this prophecy, is Christ a uh, uh, direct descendant of Zedekiah? Did Christ descend from Zedekiah? 
his lineage. Okay, so no, somebody said in the chat there. David, Aran said, isn't it? Well, he's descended from Jehoiachin, oh. right? Because remember, Jehoiachin is taken captive, and he's uh, held in prison for 36 years, and then he's released on December 25th, well, the 25th day of the 12th biblical month. And, and, and Christ is going to descend from Jehoiachin. Now, of course, Zedekiah is Jehoiachin's uncle, uh, Jehoiachin's uncle, just as uh, Jehoahaz is, because Zedekiah, who was Mataniah, and Jehoiakim and Jehoahaz were all sons of Josiah. Jehoiachin is the grandson of Josiah because Jehoiakim is his dad. But we can say that Christ is of the seven. That is, these are all of the line of David, and Christ is of the line of David. Mm -hmm. But he is the rightful king. So here we have an example of the seven and the eight. It's not a direct parallel in the sense that this is the true line. And the eighth is the counterfeit in Revelation 17. Now, we also have here uh, the last seven kings of Israel, um, going from Job, Jeroboam II all the way to Hoshea. And, and we looked at their names. The people will contend, God is remembered, retribution, comforter, Jehovah has observed, Jehovah sees, and salvation that their names mean. And I don't remember all of the applications of them, but we had lined these up with the way marks as the first, second, and third angel's message. And so one of the things we see about these way marks, the seven, so even though we're looking at seven kings here, the thing that we need to remember is that these are actually the seven way marks in a reform line, right? So when we look at these below here, we can line up the Millerite line with these kings. That's what we did in the past. And so in, in our understanding of the seven and the eighth, we can't ignore the fact that the primary application of this is the seven way marks in a reform line, and the eighth is a repeat of this history. That is, the eighth is this seven repeated again. If you wanted to call these the seven thunders or whatever, you, how you look at it, these seven way marks, we would say that the, that's going to be repeated in our history. And, and the way that I understand it is that those seven thunders are sealing up these seven way marks, and it's the unsealing of those way marks in the, what is in the seven thunders that seals this up, that is our history. That is, this movement is the unsealing of the seven thunders, and that we, we unseal them by passing through the history of Millerite history, we come to understand Millerite history as we pass through the waymarks, as we repeat history. So we can't ignore these facts. When we're dealing with the riddle, we know that it's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit of a reform line. And it's, it's a big reform line, you know, because it, it, it goes back to the past, but it's repeated again in our history. And, and so we need to understand how it's repeated. Yeah, so, and Aranda noted that all the children of Zedekiah are slain. That's why Christ doesn't descend from Zedekiah. And that's why Ezekiel considers Jehoiachin the true king, and Zedekiah's king, um, but that he knows what's going to happen to Zedekiah specifically at first. But that's what God has given him when he he counts the reign of Jehoiachin in his count rather than Zedekiah's reign in some instances. So, so we can see here that, that this is a pattern 
that we need to study in more detail if we're going to understand what's happening in Revelation 7, 17 correctly. Now, the only thing I can say in closing is what I think that Colin has found is a piece of the puzzle. And I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. But it can't be seen clearly until it's placed with all of the other pieces of the puzzle. And so this is my appeal to this movement, is that we need to recognize that God is leading a movement and not an individual. That is, we don't have an individual leader, some person that we all have to look to, as we did in the past with Jeff, because Jeff was our leader. But we are now in a situation where God has chosen, and he began this even while Jeff was leader, of bringing light to all different kinds of individuals. And what Jeff was good at doing is seeing this, these rays of light and gathering them together so that we could examine them. Now, as a movement, I don't feel that we're good at doing that right now. That is, we tend to be, and this is just my view, but I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. That is, it's not the intent of the people who are receiving the light for that to happen. But the people who are studying these things tend to have this human attitude. They tend to find people they like their studies better. They, they understand them better. You know, it fits more with their personality and the way that they study. And, and they ignore things that, well, you know, it's not really my cup of tea. So what that does is it creates this division. People start to see someone else having a message from and light from God as a threat. But we know that all of us are to be working together. And even if we see some problems with something that I'm teaching, somebody can point out some flaws or something that Dwight is teaching or Stephen or Colin or, or Daniel Fontenot or Dilio, there might be some flaws. It doesn't mean that we should ignore the light that's been given. Because those pieces of the puzzle, even though we're humans and we're flawed, and we have false interpretations of things, we don't see things fully, the only way we are going to see things fully is if we come together and study together and watch each other's, as I'm talking about the people receiving light, watch each other's presentations. And also those that are studying on their own, they're maybe not be presenters, they should be watching a variety of presenters and recognizing that all of these people are being given light from God, even if they sometimes seem at odds with each other. And that's just because they're human beings and they're flawed. So the challenge here is that we're going to, to follow the counsel that Ellen White has given of what we're supposed to be doing at the end of time. And it's going to take us time to get through this to look at all of this, this information, to look at all of the light that's coming from, coming from other sources and, and putting them all together to see the whole picture. So, so any final comments before we close with prayer? No. Okay. And and just before we close with prayer, usually I do this after, but some people might be watching the video. So we know I sent out the email, but tomorrow morning um, we're going to have the study at 7.30. Dwight will be leading out. Stephen's not doing a study this week because it's the American Groups Week. And then we're going to have a study Sunday morning dealing with the book of Joshua at 7.30 in the morning. And then we're not going to have meetings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, thirty. Thursday this coming week, but we will still have a Friday night study again and go back to our regular schedule for the next week after that. So anybody watching these videos, if you have trouble finding the video, you wonder what happened to the video, the video didn't happen yet, it, you know, talking about the Monday to Thursday next week. 
Okay, so let, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have. We're thankful for the things you teach us and for the light that has been shining upon our path. Help us to walk in it and help us to be humbled, Lord, to be meek like Christ, to be teachable, to learn in the school of Christ and to receive light, even if it comes from the humblest and weakest of your servants. Help us to compare scripture with scripture, to use Miller's rules, to have the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and see the consistency in your word. Be with us in the studies throughout this Sabbath and in our personal time with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recording stop.